Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. How can I have spiritual power? There's three basic points here. This is going to be real short. We're almost over. But I want you to pay attention. These three things are not very big and mysterious. They're very simple. But these are the three things most Christians do not have. It's pray, read, and preach. Pray, read, and preach. Do you want to get God's power in your life? You need to change your priorities and you need to change your perspective of the world. It's simple. Pray, read, preach. Turn to, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. This is one of the last places we'll go here. The Bible says that we pray through the Father to the Son. How do I pray to God? I pray, Father, right? And I ask in the, in the name of Jesus, the Son. That's how we pray. And it's, it's, that's, there's no other way. I was talking to a lady yesterday. Well, we don't really pray to Mary. We pray through Mary. Well, I'm sorry that doesn't work. Mary was a human being. She needs a Savior just like we do. Mary's in the same boat as us. Mary's in heaven because she was righteous, but not in heaven because she's God. Not in heaven because she's supernatural, right? She was not always a virgin also. The Catholics teach that. There's some strange doctrine to go along with that. But listen, praying has to go to the Father through the Son. In 1 John 5 it says, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask. We know we have the petitions that we desired of Him. The Bible is saying whatever, once you're saved, God's Holy Spirit is living in you, you ask your dad for something, He's going to give it to you. Right. If it's in His will, obviously. Lord, I just need that Lamborghini. That's not God's will for my life. All right, I don't want a Lamborghini. <laughs> I'd have to mail in my, my driver's license. No, but consider that sometimes we pray for things and we say well, well how come I didn't get what I wanted well maybe God doesn't want you to have it because you would destroy yourself yeah. maybe you're not spiritually mature yet enough to get something like that consider what you pray for in 1 Thessalonians 5 17 he says pray without ceasing how do you pray all the time when do you pray every moment of the day who do you call when you have a problem well, I don't know. We we got to call the plumber. We got to call the doctor. We better call this electrician. Hey, why don't you talk? Why don't you call God first? Are you praying step by step through the day? Are you praying without ceasing? Are you constantly trying to be in conversation with God? Because He will lead you and guide you into all truth through His Holy Spirit. Listen in Philippians four. He says, "Be careful for nothing, but everything." He says, "Everything in prayer." We go to God for everything. Well, but not my physical needs. Yes, your physical needs, your daily bread. God wants you to ask Him first. God wants you to seek Him for provision. He says, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Don't forget to say thanks, God. Oh, by the way, answered prayer, thank you. There's a young man I was talking with, Brother Chambers, yesterday. And this guy, his, his life's a wreck. He's having all sorts of problems. He's addicted to heroin. And Brother Chambers said, what do, you, what do I do? What can I do to help this guy? I said, you know, sometimes maybe jail is an answer to get that, to get, sort of save that guy's life. The guy's saved. I would hate for him to die in a ditch with a needle in his arm. But it's like, maybe we should pray the guy goes to jail. Listen, I hate jail. I don't want anybody to go to jail. But you know what happened? That guy went to jail yesterday. Wow. It's not of me. It's what he did. It was his choice. But God, his father, is looking out for him. And he says, you want to keep living like this? And then I'm going to take control of your freedom to help get your spirit back on track. Y'all pray for that guy. This guy's in serious hurt right now. Look, you're in 1 Corinthians 2. Stay there for a second. In, in James 1.5, this is very important. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. I believe this young man was asking God for the right thing to do. And then he still went against what he knew he ought to do. This guy keeps making the wrong decisions. God's going to say, okay, come on. Let me take your liberty from you. Let me take your freedom and, and try to force you and give you a last chance. Don't let your life get that way where you have to hit rock bottom before you start praying. You should start your day on your knees. You should start your day. Just take five minutes. Get by yourself and just start thanking God for what He's given you. Start asking God for the provision of the responsibilities that you have. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. It shall be given him. Listen, one of the last points. You have to pray, 
You have to read. You have to preach. As Christians, you're commanded to preach. Acts 1, it says, Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses of me. Why does God give us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Well, it secures our soul, right? It gives us knowledge. It leads us and guides us into truth. But it's also for boldness in preaching. Yeah. God has given us the Holy Spirit to be bold enough to stand up to somebody that, well, you're not really a Christian, are you? Yeah, I am. Oh, you're a Christian. Yes, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible. Oh, you believe fables. No, I believe the truth. God is real and you know it in your heart. And I believe that. God's given us the power for preaching. And listen, we should preach. If you're not preaching, if you've never preached the gospel, if you've never tried to get somebody else saved, you need to do that. In 1 Corinthians 1, he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. To the people that are on their way to hell, when you say, hey, Jesus died for your sins, they think that's foolish. They don't understand. It says, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Okay, think I'm a fool. But I'm going to cry. I'm going to compel you. I'm going to show you out of the... You have to believe this or you'll end up in hell. The people that hate us, we love them enough to try to tell them the truth. The people that mock us, I love them. I want them to know what Jesus did. And if they continue to mock Jesus and mock Jesus and mock Jesus, they better be careful. They might cross that line. Look, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Find verse number 1. And I, brethren... When I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He's saying, when I came and preached the gospel unto you, I didn't come in here with some big fancy presentation. I'm not trying to use all these uh, theological words that nobody understands. Well, if you go back to the Latin, and I give you this, it's like people get confused when you do that. And, and there, are, there is a false religious crowd that loves to do that. But here, this is written for us to understand this is not God's way. God's way is to keep it simple. The simplicity of the Gospel. Look what he says in verse 2. He says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He said, I'm not, we're not going to get off track on talking about how, you know, the sortiology, the eschatology, the, the any of the ologies. He says, I want you to know the simplicity of who Jesus is, that He's God, that He died for your sins, and you have to know that first and foremost. Look at verse 3. And I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the power, I'm sorry, of the Spirit and of power. He's saying, I didn't come up with a bunch of fancy words and I'm trying to trick you into something. He says, it's God's Holy Spirit that worked through me to convince you to tell you these things are so. I kept it simple so you would understand. I'm not using really big words and making it complicated. I want everyone to know the simplicity of the truth. And he did it in God's Holy Spirit, which gave him power. He preached the Bible simply, and that was powerful. God's Spirit was powerful enough. He didn't have to have a big presentation or big fancy words. Look what he says in verse 5. Why did he do that? He says, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. If, if I, why are you, how'd you get saved? Well, man, this guy put on such an amazing presentation. You have to go see it. Boy, he connected all the dots and used all these big words I can't remember. Well, how did you get saved? Hey, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the difference? And today there's a problem in religion that you have, everybody wants to make it really big and fancy and, and they ignore the simplicity of the gospel. They yeah. don't believe that Jesus was God. Now turn to Revelation chapter 1, last place we're going. Revelation chapter number 1. The Bible says that the Spirit will bear witness with your spirit. When you go out preaching, when you're willing to open up your mouth and preach the gospel to somebody, when you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit living in you, that Holy Spirit will bear witness with other people. Other people will say, yeah, wow, I just felt like God was talking to me through this person. I mean, when they opened the Bible, it was so easy to understand. I've always wondered these things, but you just you had all the answers right there. Listen, it's not about you as the preacher. It's about the words of God, the Spirit of God giving you power in your life. But listen, you have to pray. You have to read. You have to preach. If you will do these three things as a Christian, I promise you, I guarantee, you will have power in your life. God will give you power over all things in the other areas of your life. But if you omit them, 
then you're rejecting the commandment of God. You're ignoring very important things that He's told you to do. In Ephesians 6, He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord. It's His might we have confidence in. It's His power that we use. In Revelation 1, it says, look at verse number 3. Blessed is he that readeth. Do you want God's blessing on your life? Right here. There's a blessing for reading the Word of God. Amen. And they that hear the words of this prophecy. There is a blessing for listening to the preaching at church. Yep. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. When he says keep those things that are written in there, that's exercising godliness. That's obeying the commandment. Well, God says I shouldn't drink anymore. That's what it says in the Bible. Well, what do you want to do? Do you want God's blessing on your life? Well, God says I shouldn't have filthy conversation. I shouldn't be saying those jokes anymore. Do you want God's blessing on your life? Right? The Bible says I shall put no wicked thing before my eyes. God is commanding us to stop looking at the wickedness of the world. Stop looking at things that you shouldn't look at on the computer and on the TV. Amen. Do you want God's blessing on your life? Obey His Word. Do what He's telling you. Otherwise, you will not have any power on your life. That's right. Look, He says, the time is at hand. You understand, as Jesus was wrapping up His ministry, He told people this was the last days. Yeah, but that was 2,000 years ago. Well, in the big picture of things, it's over 6,000 years that the earth has existed. And in the last 2,000 years, do you think it's closer now than it was when you first believed? You think it's closer now than it was in Jesus' time? Yes. The time is at hand. The devil is trying to set up his kingdom. There is a conspiracy against Christians. They want you to get distracted by the world. They want you to try to look and act like everybody else instead of obeying God's Word. You need to heed to the Bible. He said you'll do well if you heed to the Bible. Exercise godliness. It's time to change your priorities. It's time to change your focus in life. It's time to change your perspective. When you look out in the world, are you looking for something you want? Or are you looking for something you can do for God? What are your priorities? Is it playing on a computer, playing a video game? Watch, oh, I got this show. I just got this show. I got to sit down and binge watch this show. Why don't you binge read the Word of God? Why don't you get online, get some good preaching, and binge watch some sermons? Just watch one after another, after another, after another. Figure it out. Grow in doctrine. Grow in the power and the Spirit of God. It's up to you, Christian. It's your choice. If you reject what God has said, you will not have power on your life. You'll be weak. You'll be under attack by the devil. And how can you defend yourself if you don't know how to use your sword? For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. If you'll take heed unto these things, you have nothing to be afraid of. You don't have to worry about a snake biting you or getting in a car wreck because God is bigger than the snake or the car or anything else. He will protect and preserve you. He says He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Christian, do you have a sound mind today? Are you sober? Do you love your brother? Do you love the, the other Christians in this church? Do you have the spirit of power on your life? Take heed to these simple things and I promise you, you will.